Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you may be. My name is Henry O, and I'm a very grateful recovered alcoholic. It's lovely to see so many people here. Thank you for reminding me one of the things that I needed to be reminded of early on in my sobriety that I am no longer alone. Um, My sobriety date is the 11th of September 2005. And for that, I'm extremely grateful that a God that I didn't understand, but had a belief in, but was terrified to tell you I believed in God, uh, stepped in and uh, removed alcohol from my life at that time. I have a home group here in Warrington in Cheshire in the UK. It's the Wycliffe Monday night 8pm meeting where we concentrate purely and utterly on Tradition 5 in carrying the message. I have a sponsor who knows he is my sponsor. And I get the privilege to sponsor, although I don't like that particular word, I get the privilege to be of service to other human beings, some of who have very kindly come along here tonight to support me, which I'm very grateful for those of you who know who you are. Thank you for being here, but they will also hold me accountable. Um, I don't speak on behalf of AA. um, And anything that I say that you may not be be able to reconcile with the big book challenge me on. I'm a big book thumper and I won't apologize for that. And I will mention the word God. And my book tells me that I don't need to apologize for mentioning the word God. As you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not originally from the UK. I was born and brought up in Dublin. I'm the youngest of three children. And I come from an alcoholic background. My father was an alcoholic who, sadly, as a very spiritually sick man, although I didn't see that at the time, emotionally, mentally, and financially, um, practically destroyed the family. I I do remember that there was always alcohol around and I come from a culture or a principle in my family at that time, which was a prejudicial idea that I, I, I was brought up with was that real men drink. That's what I was told. Um, I started drinking from a young age, but one of my earliest memories in looking back on my experience and finding my experience in this book um is in relation to when I was 14, I was at a, a school disco and I was caught drinking behind the disco. I wasn't drunk, but I was caught drinking by the head Christian brother behind the disco. And he decided it was a Friday night. He decided he was going to phone my parents and uh, tell them that I'd been caught drinking. Um, major resentment for many years on the basis of the fact that it was probably the one and only Friday night that my dad was actually home and picked up the phone. Um, and my dad then made a decision and looking back in hindsight, I could see what he was trying to do. He was probably going to try and teach me how to drink like a gentleman. Still to this day of my life, I'm still not quite sure what a gentleman drinks like. Um, Cause it really wasn't much drinking like a gentleman in my life. So on the Sunday morning when I got up and got dressed, he took me to the local pub with him as a 14-year-old boy. And he basically said to me, for every drink I have, you will have the same. And naturally, I walked into that pub, a terrified, frightened little child of 14. As soon as I put alcohol into my body, my perception on life changed. I no longer had a sense of separation. I was no longer restless, irritable, discontent. I was in a position where my perception on life believed that I knew best and I was telling my dad's friends how they should not be spending so much time in the pub and leaving their wives and children at home. And I was trying to tell the landlord of the pub how he should be running his pub. But naturally at 14, it wasn't long until I actually eventually hit the floor and I had to be physically carried home to my house. After a a very long conversation down the big white telephone in the bathroom. Um, I was put to bed and I remember getting up the next morning on the Monday morning and sitting at the breakfast table in front of my brother, my sister, um, 
my mother and father and actually saying that I was dying, that I was ill. Um, and I remember actually saying out loud, I will never, ever do that again. That was at 14. Probably I could say ominous warning I failed to heed. Because on page 24, it tells me in the book is the fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. My so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. I am unable at certain times to bring into my consciousness sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. I am without defence against the first drink. And that was the pattern that would continue in my life and even in my working life. I would perhaps go out with some work colleagues uh, and end up getting drunk and coming home again in a bad situation and waking up the next morning, going to the bathroom before I would be able to go anywhere, uh, dry retching and vomiting and saying to myself, oh, God, I'm not going to drink till Friday. I'm not going to I'm, I'm not going to have another drink till next week. I go into work at nine o'clock by lunchtime or two o'clock. All my colleagues are talking about which pub or where they're going that night. And I cannot bring into my mind with sufficient force the suffering humiliation of two or three hours ago. I'm saying, yeah, let's go. And that's the pattern of my of my drinking that continued. I got married at a young age. <coughs> uh, at 21. And looking back in hindsight, both my ex-wife and myself, uh, we both agreed that we got married for both of us to get away from an alcoholic environment. The motive for marriage was really the wrong motive. Um, and I have two amazing children from that marriage. I had a fancy job with a fancy title um, that basically um, I had obtained through a resume or CV that was full of lies and pardon my language, bullshit. And every day I went to work was a day where I would be in absolute and utter fear. Today's the day that they're going to find out. I don't know what I'm doing. My marriage broke down after 14 years. And I, in my, in my first four years in recovery in this program, I was always very careful about the wording I would use. When I say I was careful about it, I would choose wording that would minimize or try and rationalize mistakes errors or wrongdoings I had done in my life because I was terrified of your opinion of me. Well, with all due respect, I don't mean this disrespectfully to anybody. I don't care about your opinion of me. It's none of my business. And what I would basically say in my first four years of my journey uh, in recovery would be, I would turn around and say in 14 years of marriage, I had two affairs that split up the marriage. See, it doesn't sound as bad as what I actually did. What I actually did was I committed adultery twice in the space of 14 years to an absolutely wonderful, gentle, beautiful lady who did not deserve it. But clear indication in my life, and we can see it very much in Bill's story, no matter what I had, it was never enough. The next car, the next house, the next job, the next promotion. So as soon as I got what I thought I wanted and I placed my happiness on external things, basically, as soon as I got it, not long after, I wanted something else. It didn't satisfy me. It didn't fill me. It didn't make me feel... It didn't take away that sense of separation. It didn't deal with the rest of serviceable discontent because it soon came back. So I got the woman, I wanted another woman. Tried to work it out after seven years of marriage, which we did. And then seven years later, I go and do the same thing. So going back to my step one experience and the understanding, my understanding of the unmanageability of my life as described on page 44. Uh, going into 45, if mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. But I found that such codes of philosophy did not save me. No matter how much I tried, I could wish to be moral. I could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact, I could will, will these things with all my might. But the needed power wasn't there. My human resources, as marshaled by the will, 
were not sufficient. They failed utterly. Morally, I know it's wrong to commit adultery. But in my mind, I will rationalize it and reason it under some stupid excuse while well, she doesn't understand me. And hence the reason why I can see the unmanageability of my life before I ever crossed a line into alcoholism. I'm not a great believer in crossing a line into alcoholism because if there was a line to my mind, I kept moving the damn line because my my, my illness progressed. <laughs> After my marriage failed, um, I got caught drink driving um, in 1998. I remember I got caught doing 100 mile an hour down a motorway and I uh, I was over the limit and I was arrested and I was put into a police, police cell uh, overnight. And see, even in 1998, I went to an AA meeting because everybody else told me I had a problem with drinking and I went to appease everybody else. And uh, I remember I even went to that meeting and I sat in the room and I was even too proud to turn around and say I'm a newcomer. When they asked, was there any newcomer, I just sat in the meeting. And again, how I can try and rationalise and minimise. I'm hearing people talk about things. Um, I heard one, me one man mention that he had been in jail or been in prison. And my mind tells me I've never been to prison, I've never been to jail. I had just spent in the previous week a night in a police cell. It's the same damn thing, just spelt differently. So I have a mind that cannot tell true from false. From my experiences, I have a mind that no matter what, and it clearly tells me more about alcoholism, um, the delusion that I am like other people, or presently maybe, has to be smashed. I will always have an alcoholic mind that will try and drive me back to a drink. I remember actually sitting in that police cell, and for those from the UK who will know what I'm talking about, I remember thinking and sitting thinking, if I'd only just taken the M62 instead of the M56, that's rationalising it. That's the type of mind. I'm looking to blame somebody else. I'm looking for whatever's going wrong in my life. It's not my fault. And I, I, I did the same thing with my divorce. It's not my fault. I'm not willing to look at me. <clears throat> Sadly, I didn't stay in AA. I do remember... Uh, I thought, yeah, lovely bunch of people, but it's not for me. And my drinking got worse. And with losing the fancy company car, with the fancy job, with the fancy title, I then had to look at it. And the house that I had bought after my divorce was about to be repossessed. Because those brown envelopes that came through the door, those bills that were stacked up nicely in the kitchen worktop, yeah, meant that if I opened them, I had less money for drink or less money to buy other things and seeking my happiness outside of me. And I remember I got a good idea, what I classed as a good idea. When I was in Ireland and I originally left school, I'd been trained in the licence trade of the bar trade. Uh, and I thought, right, I'll go into the licence trade here in the UK. And I, again, delusion. The book is clear. I'm driven by a hundred forms of self-delusion. The delusion that I had was that There'll be that much alcohol around. It will have the sweetie chocolate factory effect that I'll get fed up with it and I won't touch it. I won't go near it, not knowing what I suffered from, not knowing anything about alcoholism. And the other reason that I went into it, because I knew full well it would solve my accommodation problem because my accommodation came with the pub. I went around different breweries doing relief work here and there around the UK, which were usually geographicals, jumping from working from one brewery to another brewery, because usually before I got sacked, um, my son quite often jokes that his dad was the one that probably brought in 24-hour license trading before it actually became law in the UK. And I came back here to Warrington, uh, where I live. And again, in my first four years of my journey, I would be very careful with the words. And what I used to actually say was, I ended up becoming the club steward or club manager of a private members club. That sounds impressive, doesn't it? it? was private members, but it was an Irish club. And it was rough. Trust me. It was full of alcoholics, degenerates, drug addicts, and that was just the bar staff. 
Now, in order to get a full set of dentures, you needed 32 customers in one place. That's how rough it was. But whilst I was there, I was drinking with them. Um, and what I used to do was, and again, in my mind, look at the rationalization. I would borrow money from the till to take all those customers up to the pub up the road so they would actually pat me on the back and tell me how wonderful I was and I was the best club steward the Irish club ever had. So I could get my sense of my sense of need, being needed, wanted and loved from somebody else by trying to buy that because it wasn't enough. <clears throat> At stage, my children had uh, had made a decision because they were sick of the broken promises that they would uh, they cut contact with me. I hadn't seen my daughter for five years and I hadn't seen my son for four years. Because they were sick of me me making making an appointment to see them on a Saturday afternoon at three o'clock. But I'd get up on a Saturday morning, I'd let the cleaners in, and then I would start drinking with some of the customers when they arrived. And as soon as I put that first drink into my body, every decision I made for the rest of the day was based on where my next drink was coming from. And I didn't give a damn who I stepped on, who I let down, who I broken promises or otherwise. That never entered my head. That's how powerful alcohol was. So they eventually, within the Irish club, they decided to do a stock take in inventory. And they had discovered, see, when I took that money on a daily basis, in my mind, I used the word borrow with the intention of paying it back on Friday when I get my wages. But come Friday, naturally, I use my wages to take the customers up the road and didn't pay the money back. So in the space of just short of two years that I was working there, when they did a stock take, they had found I had stolen nine and a half thousand pounds. And they gave me two weeks to leave, and two weeks to pay that money back, or they would bring in the police. About the only person that was left by my life at that stage was my sister in Ireland, who paid that money. I have since made that amends, financial amends, complete. But see, I left that club with two black plastic sacks. And all the fair-weathered friends who stayed for lock-ins or who stayed late at night or the ones I brought up the road, none of them answered text messages or phone calls. And to this day, I'm actually grateful that they didn't because God had a different plan. God intervened and went, they're not going anywhere near you. They can't help you in any way, shape, or form. And I was even way too proud to ask in the local homeless shelter for a bed. Can't go there. What could I do? What would happen if somebody knew me? Look at the pride in that. <clears throat> so I stayed on the streets of Warrington begging as a homeless drunk sleeping under park benches, sleeping in the bus stops, sleeping in doorways, anywhere I could find. And then most of my drinking was based on what I could steal. Shoplift. Um, I was on the streets for nearly about four and a half months, nearly five months. Um, and, and trust me, personal hygiene was not on my priority list in any way, shape or form. And I remember I was kneeling in a shop doorway with my little polystyrene cup in front of me. And as I said, I hadn't seen my daughter in five years and I hadn't seen my son in four years. And I looked to my left and I saw my daughter walking up the road. Now, my natural instinct is I don't like pain, emotional, mental, physical. My national instinct is to run. But I didn't. God had a different plan. But I do remember that I'm, I'm sitting there with my polystyrene cup in front of me, not having washed, shaved or otherwise showered in four and a half months. <laughs> and my bottle of cider beside me. And I'm thinking and I'm begging God, please, God, don't let her see me. Don't let her recognize me. 
but she came up to where I was and she leaned against the wall next to the doorway. She stared at me. And see, when I read that piece on page 24 that I'm un unable to bring into my, my uh, bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. See, I'm so selfish and self-centered. I'm thinking about my suffering, my humiliation. Well, I'll tell you what. I could see the suffering and humiliation in her face as the tears started to well up in her eyes. And she stared at me and she pointed at me and she turned to the lad that she was with, who was her then boyfriend. And what she actually said was, see that man there? That man used to be my dad. I'll never forget that. And I never want to. That was the day that I made a decision based on self, based on my selfishness, my self-centeredness, as if I had not caused enough chaos in my family's life that I would do what the book talks about as the ultimate sacrifice. <laughs> With the little money that I had begged, I uh, I bought over-the-counter medication. I walked to a DIY store, a vegan Q, and uh, I stole a bottle of white spirits. Why I've done white spirits, I've never known. I've never understood why I did that. And I sat in the corner of the car park, basically, taking the medication and downing the white spirits, tears rolling down my eye, not really knowing whether I wanted to die or not really knowing whether I wanted to live. Bill's story explains it really well. There's a scent or a paragraph of Bill's story where it says on page eight, no words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Quick sand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I'd been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. Every time I read that and I get the privilege to read that with another human being when I'm working with another alcoholic, that hits me in my gut. God had a different plan and sent an angel. <clears throat> that was the 11th September 2005. To this day, I do not know who that angel was. I ended up in a general hospital and then I ended up in a psychiatric hospital. I was committed into a psychiatric hospital because I was considered to be a danger to myself. In the psychiatric hospital, while I was there and then dealing with psychiatrists and psychologists and counsellors and everyone else, if they mentioned alcohol as potentially being my problem, I would challenge them and I would turn around and say, you are joking. Alcohol is the only thing that keeps me alive. So alcohol had become my solution. It's not my problem. I was visited by a, 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 an old timer, a gentleman on a 12 step call, came to see me uh, and uh, we were having coffee and he basically turned around and he said, Henry, have you ever tried AA? Now, bearing in mind what I told you, in 1998, I'd been to one meeting and my response was, yeah, I tried AA, it doesn't work for me. And now I know when when you have an old timer who basically gets a slight smirk on his face, there's a pause before he responds to you. He's about to come out with something profound that you're absolutely not going to be able to respond to. Trust me, apparently I've become one. Um, he looked at me with that slight smirk and then he turned around and said, you're dead right, him." A doesn't work for you. You work for AA. Got me. I hadn't heard that in that meeting that I'd been to. So I went down to the meeting on the Monday night, uh, and it was the first time I'd seen the scrolls of the steps and the traditions on the wall. I do remember when I walked in thinking, good God, there was only 10 commandments, but you lot have added two more. Um, so I, uh, I sat in that room and I heard people talking about there was a lot of long sobriety in that room. And I heard people talking about um, doing normal things like turning up for work, 
the next day, um, buying a car, um, being invited to family events, and then somebody quite rudely mentioned something about paying bills. But I do remember I walked out of that room with a label that I put on it and my emotion as envy. What you have, I want, and I want it now. Because God had dealt me a shit hand, and I deserve it right now. That's the way my mind, my impatient mind, was going. So I borrowed a copy of the big book from the nurse's station, because <laughs> there was one on the, on, on the ward. And I sat on my bed. And I thought, I think I better read this How It Works thing, because they read How It Works. Because bearing in mind, in 1998, when I went to the meeting, they read How It Works. Don't get me wrong. Thank you for the reading of How It Works. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. But I'm sitting in a room and I'm new, and you're talking about how it works. How what works? I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. So they read How It Works again in this meeting that I attended. And uh, I remember thinking, I better read this how it works thing, because naturally, by next Monday night's meeting, I'm going to have to have done these steps, all of them. Um, and I'm going to have to basically tell them how they're going to need to run that meeting by next Monday, because, you know, it wasn't to my liking the way they ran it, because I wasn't the centre of attention like I normally am, no matter where I should be. And I remember I sat and I was reading how it works. And I came to step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. I slammed the book shut and I flung it on the floor in anger. How dare they? That book is insinuating I'm insane. How dare they? I'm sitting on a bed in a locked up psychiatric ward and I can't even see my own truth physically right in front of me. How delusional am I? A hundred forms of self-delusion. I left that hospital and I ended up uh, going into a YMCA homeless shelter, a little one-room bed sit. I quite often joke, you may have heard the expression, there isn't enough room to swing a cat. Well, when I moved in, the cat moved out. There wasn't room for both of us. <laughs> and I lived there for a period of time. And I continued going to meetings. And I remember I asked a man to be my sponsor. And the reason I have to be honest, I asked the man to be my sponsor was I heard him turn around and say he was a bank manager. I thought, Aha, you're just what I need. You're going to sort my finances out. Selfish, self-centered, self-seeking. Um, that man took me through the work using the 12 and 12. Don't get me wrong. I have no animosity, no resentment against that man in any way, shape or form. A man can only teach you what he knows. I went around rooms for four years, mainly sharing my opinion rather than my experience. So I've had to go back to many rooms and make amends. And four years into this fellowship, I hit what's called a sober rock bottom. I hit a brick wall. I'm planning my own suicide. Um. Basically, a vision for you describes it quite well. Now and then, a serious drinker being dry at the moment says, I don't miss it at all, feel better, work better, having a better time. As ex-problem drinkers, we smile at such a sally. We know that our friend is like a boy whistling in the dark to keep up his spirits. He fools himself inwardly. He would give anything to take half a dozen drinks and get away with them. He will presently try the old game again. By the grace of God, in that four years period, and it had to be God's grace. Nothing else. I did not drink. <clears throat> I ended up coming back to AA because I'd abandoned AA for a period of time because, see, I know better and I can do this on my own. And I came to a meeting here in Warrington on the Friday night and I sat in a meeting. And it was a meeting where people had known me because I had I'd been sponsored into starting that meeting three years previous. And I sat and I listened to the main chair. And I remember then, as soon as the main chair was finished, and probably the very first time in my life I ever cried in front of other people or another human being. And I remember actually saying, with the tears again rolling down my face, I'm in trouble. I'm either going to drink again or I'm going to take my own life. And the second option seems better than the first. 
Now, look at the defect of character of pride. I'd rather die sober so you lot can come along and pat each other on the back and say, well, at least he died sober. Now, I'm not making <clears throat> any derogatory marks about any meeting. Every meeting has its purpose. But my experience was that in that meeting, nobody knew what to say to me. In the smoke break at half time, one person came to me and said, just don't pick up the first drink and keep coming back. Sounds easy, doesn't it? If I just don't pick up the first drink and keep coming back. However, in my head, I'm screaming, come back for what? <coughs> Excuse me. Please tell me. How do I not pick up that first drink? I'd rather die than pick up that first drink. But see, I'm going, I then start going back to meetings and I'm sitting in rooms. And I probably did it within my first four years as well. I'm so eager to tell you how bad my day was or how my car has broken down or how this has gone wrong or a relationship's going wrong. Because I'm still selfish and self-centered and I'm not thinking about the newcomer who's sitting in the corner who's dying of untreated alcoholism. So I don't use the expression, just don't pick up the first drink and keep coming back. I don't use that anymore in any way, shape or form. My question to a newcomer is, do you want to know how to not pick up the first drink? Don't get me wrong. Meetings are important, but meetings are not the program. The program is in the book. It's not in the, 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 the purpose of a meeting is to present, make a presentation, an adequate presentation of the program to the newcomer. <laughs> I had to go around quite a few rooms before I found a man who was armed with the facts about himself. And he walked into an AA room and he talked about, funny enough, there's a chapter called There is a Solution. And he talked about a solution. And he talked and he was quoting pages from this book. And I actually got told, stay away from him, he's a big book thumper. But I went to him after the meeting and you can even still see the, the character defect of pride again. I didn't turn around and say, will you help me? What I said was, will you take me through the work? See how my pride, again, wouldn't allow me to ask for help. And he said, certainly I will. He said, uh, be at my house at six o'clock tomorrow night. That doesn't mean one minute past six or one minute before six. It means be, be at my house at six o'clock. I remember standing outside his door, literally two minutes to six, going 58, 59, knock. And I went in. And he said, come in, sit down. And he took me to the title page. And bearing in mind, you have the very first promise on the title page of the book. It says the story of how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. I missed that for many years. Then he took me to the triangle, recovery, unity and service. And he said, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. They will require yes or no answers. Recovery. Have you been through this work using the first 164 pages of this book? No. Unity. Are you going to meetings? I'm about to give him a litany of all the terrible meetings that I've been to in the last couple of days or the last couple of weeks. He went, it requires a yes or no answer. I'll give you a yes. Service, have you ever taken anybody through that? He said, I already know the answer. I said, don't bother. He said, think about it. We have a three-part recovery program, a three-part solution where you're living in one of the three parts, expecting the results of all three. How selfish and self-centered are you? Thinking that that would work. And going around rooms, giving people the impression that it would work. And then he asked me two really pertinent questions. He asked me, had I ever made a solemn oath and promise after going out and drinking to another human being, to myself or to anyone? 
that I would never do it again. And had I broken that promise? And I said, hundreds. He said, why do you think you couldn't keep that promise? I couldn't answer that question. <coughs> then he said, when you drink, did you go out with an intention of just having one or two, but yet you drank to oblivion or blackout nearly every time I drank? Absolutely. And then he took me to the line again on page 44 that says, if when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking you find you've lost control, you're probably an alcoholic. Then he hit me with a question, one of those slight smirks, a pause, and he said, right, now what are you going to do about it? That hit me right in the face. I said, hang on, I came to AA for you lot to get me sober. I placed the responsibility of my sobriety in AA's hands in thinking that sitting in meetings, doing a little bit of service here and there, because I was involved in service my first four years, I was involved in prison liaison and I was involved in public information at intergroup level, thinking that that would keep me sober. And it didn't. There was no instructions in the 12 and 12 on how to have a vital spiritual experience. This book basically talks about precise, specific, clear-cut directions. That man took me through the work line for line, word for word. We turned statements into questions in the book. Now, bearing in mind, they are not questions that need to be answered. Basically, the, the AA questions don't demand answers. They demand experience. Do I, do I find my experience in this book? And absolutely, I do. My difference between step two, when I did it through the 12 and 12, and step two, doing it properly with him, I'm grateful that man did not assume that I knew what an alcoholic was. By the way, after four years, I didn't. It wasn't until he hit me with an iron and 44. You know, that's when I found out what an alcoholic is. I've lost the power of choice, whether I will drink or not. And when I do drink, I've lost the power of control when I do drink. I'm powerless. And then in the unmanageability of my life, unable to keep moral and philosophical convictions galore. In doing that, in my four years, when I'm looking at literally thinking of taking my own life, when I'm getting involved in things in those four years that I should not have been involved in, my alcoholism coming out in different directions. Yeah. What do I do? I destroy personal relationships, the symptoms of my unmanageability. I'm prey to misery and depression. I'm unable to control my emotional natures. I'm, I have a sense of uselessness to others, and I'm full of fear. That's exactly where I was four years into this fellowship. The spiritual malady, as it's talked about, or the bedevilments on page 52. <clears throat> he took me through the work, line for line, word for word. Step two, the difference I had in step two when I did it through the 12 and 12, when I'm asked to make a choice, was God either everything or was he nothing? I basically said, yeah, he's everything. But in my mind, I'll have a part-time God Monday to Friday, leave me alone Saturday and Sunday, because that's where the women are. So I hadn't made that choice. You know, the book talks about it, that God does not make too hard terms with those who seek it. So I have to fully concede to my innermost self that I'm alcoholic. I also have to fully concede to my innermost self that God is either everything or he's nothing because lack of power, that is my dilemma. Where am I to find that power? The step two is asked me just coming, come to believe that there is a power. So if it is a necessity that you struggle with, step two, on that basis, just place yourself in a position to be found by God. Open your mind. Lay aside prejudice. When I made that conscious decision that God is everything in my life, and trust me, he is, he is right here, right now with me, before I came on this meeting and during this meeting. Basically, I'm then able to go in and take step three properly. Because bearing in mind, the book asks me, being convinced I'm now at step three, what do I need to be convinced of? The three pertinent ideas that I'm alcoholic, drunk or sober, and cannot manage my own life that probably no human power can relieve my alcoholism. That includes my sponsor. That includes the people in the meetings. That includes the people in AA. That God can and will if he's sought, just asking me to seek him. 
those three pertinent ideas are simply a summary of everything that I've read and found my experience be, be, between pages 20 and 57 in the book. That's the, they're just a summary of what I've read. And going into, into step three, basically, and looking at it, particularly in 60, 61 and 62, when I'm looking at it, in, in going into step three, my selfishness and self-centeredness, the book talks about the vital spiritual experience that's required, which is a revolutionary ideas, emotions and attitude, which were once the guiding forces of these men, turned the statement into experience. What were once the guiding forces? What were my guiding forces? If I'm being guided, I'm being driven. If I'm being driven, what am I being driven by? Guess what? It tells me. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, a hundred forms of self-delusion, a hundred forms of self-seeking and self-pity. They were my guiding forces. That The world revolved around me. So a revolutionary change in my outlook on life that's the vital spiritual experience that I'm seeking to find. And I can only find that when I resign my position as playing God in my own life. Clearly, it basically talks about it in page 62. When I got to step three with this man that, who took me through the work properly, who's still my sponsor, he asked me about the decision I was making in three. And my response was, my decision is to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. He said, that's an affirmation of the decision you've made before that. You're wrong. And I tried to argue the point. He said, read the book. It says, this is the how and the why of it. First of all, I had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Is that my experience? Absolutely. Next, I decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God is going to be my director. He is the principal. I am his agent. He is the father. I'm his child. For four years in this fellowship, I was the principal and God was my agent. And I tried to argue this point. He said, well, read the step three promises on page 63. When I sincerely take such a position, what position? That from here on in, he's the director, he's the principal, I'm the agent, he's the father, I'm the child. All sorts of remarkable things follow. I have a new employer. And when we talk about God does not make too hard terms with those who seek him, what terms is God actually going to make? Well, it clearly says it on the next line. He provides what I need. One, if I keep close to him, my experience is in 10 and 11, and two, perform his work well in 12. There's the terms. They're not that difficult to keep. So when I took step three properly and on my knees, offered myself to God to build with me and do with me whatever he wants, technically, once I take step three properly, my life is no longer my business. It's his business. I go where I'm sent. Whilst I'm going out and doing what he needs me to do, and what I'm trying to do here this evening is bear witness to his, uh, to those I would help of his power, his love, and his way of life that's taking part in my life today. Because exactly what's going on. I did it thorough step four. And see, even in my, in my early days in step four, <laughs> when I originally did step four, I used, if you use them, I'm not making any comment. It's not for me to judge. I use pre-printed sheets where column three was a tick box exercise. The seven areas of self that were affected. But by the time I'm getting to sheet 10 or 11, I'm, pardon my language, I'm bored or pissed off ticking boxes and I just tick all of them. Yeah, wrong. So I don't know. I need to know how my pride was affected. So what he got me to do in doing a proper step four was name, column two, resentment. Now, what he made sure of as well was when we made the list, I would then take the name from the list and I would write a paragraph. I would look at that paragraph and analyze that paragraph as to how many resentments I had against that person or individual. I had five, six, seven resentments against my dad. Separate page for a separate resentment. Why? Because the seven areas of self are going to be affected differently for each resentment. So column three is going to show me clearly where self-reliance fail me, where, where my pride, my self-esteem, my pocketbook, my personal relations and sex relations 
basically write a sentence on how it how it affected my pride and then go to column four we we clearly in column four basically i had to look at the answer the four the answer the five questions you know um where was I, where was i selfish dishonest self-seeking or afraid and then the fifth question the one we don't like where am i to blame the most freeing line in this book and if you don't believe me try a step four and five the line that will give you the most freedom in this book is so my troubles i think are basically of all my are of my own making they're not of your making because the book talks about step four holding if we turn back to the list for it held the key to the future well see i can be so selfish and self-centered i'm talking i'm thinking about the key to my future because it's all about me naturally absolutely page one through four denies that and tells me different it basically says cling to the thought that in god's hands the dark past is the great possession you have the key to life and happiness for others with it you can avert death and misery for them oh hang on so step four isn't all about me no it's not it's about clearing the wreckage of my past it's about finding out what character defects are blocking me from god from you and being of use to god Clearly, I sat with that man and I shared everything. Several hours I shared with God, myself and him. And basically, when, when you think about it, we don't quite often hear a lot being said about the step five promises <laughs> in, in the rooms, um, which are clearly on page 75. Withholding nothing, I am delighted. I can look the world in the eye. I can be alone at perfect peace and ease. My fears fall from me. I begin to feel the nearness of my creator. I may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now I begin to have a spiritual experience. There's where the spiritual experience starts, clearly, in step five. Absolutely. Six and seven, there's a, a, a beautiful book and six and seven called uh, Breathing Underwater, Spirituality in the Twelve Steps, Richard Rohr. He describes step six and seven very easily, very easily. Six, admit I've got them. The key defects of character. Seven, get out of the way. See, I heard so many times in rooms in my past, I'm working on my character defects. I've tried it. Trust me, it's painful, and the experience is that when I try to work on my pride, I become more prideful. <laughs> I made a full list of people that I needed to make amends, do proper amends, and go back, and I've done my amends. I have no amends left from my original step forward of four years in this fellowship. And then I started working on clearly living in the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12. See, a very important word, thank you for the reading of how it works, a very important word that I missed for many years and how it works is those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this program. Cool. My first four years, I didn't need 10, 11, 12. See, you don't understand. My case is different. It's not for me. It's for you lot because my ego told me I didn't. 10, 11, and 12, I am strict with the disciplines of 10 throughout the day. And 11, I am strict with the disciplines of a, a, upon awakening and when I retire at night. Step 12. Book talks about it. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result. See, I read that step as a result. So I was looking for other results. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result. Recovery. Tried to carry this message to alcoholics. Unity. Practice these principles in all my affairs, service. That's my step 12. Where am I now? That girl who saw me on the streets, who turned around and stared me in the eye as the tears rolled down, started to roll down her face, who said that man used to be my dad. Coming up to eight years now. Eight years ago, I walked her down the aisle at her wedding. How the hell does that happen? I have a roof over my head, shoes on my feet, clothes on my back, food in my fridge. My needs are met on a daily basis. 
I have a car that's fully taxed, insured, and MOT'd. How does that happen? He provides what I need if I keep close to him and perform his work well. Everything I have in my life is only on loan. It's not doesn't belong to me. See, I'll push it aside, not for the, not for the, <laughs> not for the first drink, but for the second drink. Because I have an alcoholic mind that, if I am not in fit spiritual condition, will always try and drive me back to a drink. How do I maintain that spiritual condition? The answer is on the next line. Every day is a day when I must carry the vision of God's will into all of my activities. There's a line on page 15 in Bill's story. I told you that I find my experience in this book. Yeah. And we talk about sharing experience, strength, and hope. And if you've doubts about this program working, listen to this line. I've seen men come out of asylums and resume a vital place in the lives of their families and communities. You're looking at one. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.